All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna start with our first presentation. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, so my name is Allie Carey and I'm the Director of Programs here at the Steve Rumler Hope Network. And hi, I'm Marissa Wolf. I'm a Product Manager with SRHN. Today, Allie and I are gonna talk about stigma and substance use disorders. So today's presentation is gonna cover what is stigma, where does stigma come from, different types of stigma, the effects of stigma, and fighting stigma. So let's begin with what stigma is. So by its definition, stigma is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. Stigma is the negative associations a person, community, or culture has towards a specific characteristic or behavior, like a substance use disorder. Stigma can be directed towards any number of things, including medical conditions, gender, race, sexuality, religion, culture, or nationality. And a couple of things that stigma might look like on your day-to-day -day life are gonna be using slang or slurs that disparage people or groups of people, jokes made at the expense of individuals in the stigmatized group, people or groups repeatedly being shown in media in negative ways and devaluing the well-being, health, or safety of the stigmatized group. Before we go any further, we really want to emphasize that stigma is something that is learned the same way anything else is. Stigma can be unlearned, and that is what we're hoping to really do today. The first step here is really recognizing the existence of stigma and the harm it can cause. So in March, we posted an ad for a free naloxone training. On the right of the screen here, you can see the actual post, including our caption and the infographic. We want to, before we go into the comments that we're going to show that are very stigmatic, we want to give a quick content advisory warning here as the comments contain strong and negative language that some people may find upsetting. So to start, we had a lot of comments saying simply don't do drugs or simply stop doing drugs, including here you can say right in the middle, the best way to prevent overdose is just to quit. We also had a few comments claiming that portraying yourself as a junkie makes it easier to get naloxone. Some comments entirely lacked compassion and a knowledge of substance use disorders and intersectional issues related. Worst of all, we received comments like this. Let them die. So let's begin to unpack this stigma and let's start by understanding where stigma comes from. Stigma can be generated from a variety of sources, including cultural norms, personal experience, and media. And these will be the three specific categories that we focus on today. So starting with cultural norms, these are shared standards for behavior that can be tied to religion, social groups, gender, and more. These are the expectations an individual feels based on factors that can influence their understanding of substance use disorders. And these can be taught explicitly or through social interactions. This is something that we'll see with the really reductive approaches here. It's an emphasis when a young age with the right and wrong model that can characterize substance use and people who engage with it as bad. So all of these issues are really reminders of the importance of education we provide on substance use disorders and addiction. And our previous examples of stigma that we were showing in the comments demonstrate how the moral failure and hazard argument fit perfectly here. And we want to remind you that it's continually important to recognize that substance use disorders are diseases and not a moral failure or compromise. So cultural norms are not the same as absolute moral standards. Cultural norms are not universal. They are tied to both cultural environments and other influencing factors. Consider the various ways here where alcohol can be viewed as inappropriate behaviors depending on the circumstance. So we have underage drinking, drinking while pregnant, religious prohibitions, drinking and driving, and binge drinking. Now consider how all these standards may vary depending on place and time. Moving on to personal experience, we can see personal experience can shape a person's understanding of substance use disorders. This might include a history of exposure to someone else with substance use disorder or how the people in our lives treat or discuss substance use. So with personal experience, it's really important to also discuss a few psychological and sociological ideas 
that can help us understand how people will interpret experiences. So for negativity bias, we find that people tend to feel and perceive negative events more powerfully than positive ones. This can be particularly impactful if someone had a negative experience with someone with a substance use disorder. Next, labeling theory. People find comfort and control in labeling and categorizing others, especially those found to deviate from cultural and social norms. This can place stereotypes on people with substance use disorders and make them feel as though their substance use disorder is all people notice. Finally, we have to talk about compassion fatigue. People working in demanding fields may experience emotional and physical exhaustion that leads to a diminished ability to empathize or feel compassion for others. Compassion fatigue can be especially common within first year medical responders and individuals who work within the field of addiction, overdose prevention, and harm reduction. Good, finally we'll cover media. So media and popular uh, media forms can shape a person's understanding of substance use. Movies, shows, and novels that depict substance use can rely on extreme and sensational portrayals, leaving audiences with the impression of the worst possible outcomes. Here we have three movies that really perfectly display this point. And the important thing to remember with this is that stigma in any media is never okay and can only cause further harm. We'll delve into this further when we talk more about language choice, but one of the most negatively impactful parts of media is word choice. So news media often uses stigmatizing language when discussing addiction, framing substance use disorders as a criminal or moral issue, and reinforcing this notion for the viewing in the public. So if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that a study from 2020 shows that of the analyzed articles, the use of the word addict in online news found that 89.2% of those that use the word used it in a stigmatizing way. So a very, very high amount of them. So now that we understand a lot of the common roots of stigma, let's talk about the different types of stigma. Stigma is typically broken up into three main categories, social, structural, and self-stigma. Beginning with social stigma, social stigma is when people display negative attitudes or behaviors towards people who use drugs or towards their friends and family members and circulate those beliefs through social interactions. Social stigma is what most people think of when they think of stigma. And social stigma is how the negative associations and attitudes towards a characteristic are really circulated between people and groups. Some examples of social stigma are gonna include negative labels and images in everyday conversations and social media, talking about addiction and substance use disorders like it's a choice, and the judgment and discrimination of social stigma can also lead to self-stigma, which we'll talk about later, which causes further harm, like not reaching out for help and using drugs alone. So social stigma is divided into two groups. We're gonna start with in-group, in-group stigma is what happens within a certain group an individual belongs to, including race, culture, socioeconomic status, religion, and more. An example of this is cultural taboos about substance use may prohibit use of certain or any substances. We see this a lot within the East African and Somali communities in Minnesota, where there can be a lot of concern about how being diagnosed with a substance use disorder will impact the faith community that they're a part of. An outcome of this in-group social stigma is that people with use disorders may not share within members of their in-group because they're worried that they would judge or disapprove of it. Next, there is out-group. Out-group uh, social stigma is stigma that is directed from one group towards members of another group on the basis of race, culture, socioeconomic status, religion, and more. An example here would be people may have negative perceptions about unsheltered individuals and be more critical of their substance use as a result. The outcome of outgroup social stigma is it disincentivizes addressing substance use in other groups and also creates additional outgroup division. Moving on to structural. So structural stigma is the societal and institutional manifestation of these attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that create and perpetuate prejudice and discrimination. So some examples of structural stigma are gonna include policies in health and social services that increase stigma, such as not providing services until drug use is better managed, healthcare and first responders not taking people affected by drug use seriously, 
and workplace policies that cause harm unintentionally and encourage people to hide their use to prevent them from seeking help. A good example of this is unnecessary drug tests. So structural is going to be divided into three categories. We'll start with healthcare. Healthcare structural stigma is going to be low quality of care for people with substance use disorders, limited access to behavioral health treatment and other services, or bureaucratic barriers to accessing behavioral health treatment, and inadequate funding compared to that of physical care. An example of this is insurance may not fully cover the cost of a substance use disorder treatment. So an outcome of this is that people with a substance use disorder may not receive treatment for their substance use disorder or other health concerns that they may have. Moving on, next we have our provider in treatment. This is going to be hostility from general care providers, miss or under diagnosis or of other health concerns due to assumptions made about the patient or overuse of abstinence only strategies. An example of this is a clinical provider might fail to address the patient's depression, blaming their use disorder for their symptoms. Here we find that people, again, may not receive appropriate treatment for their SUD or other co-occurring disorders. Finally, we have the criminal legal. Here we find that the overcriminalization of substance use, we have the prioritizing punitive over rehabilitative response, and we have laws designed to target individuals with use disorders. An example here is incarcerated individuals do not consistently receive treatment for use disorders and are often released without insurance or treatment options. So an outcome here is that they may experience additional collateral consequences of legal contact overall. Finally, we'll cover our self-stigma. Self-stigma is an individual's response to social and structural stigma directed towards them. Internalized negativity can cause additional harm and distress. Some outcomes of social stigma include lower self-esteem and feelings of shame, an individual not accessing support, and an individual hiding their use or using alone. So self-stigma will also be divided into three categories, beginning with enacted and experienced. Enacted and experienced is going to reflect the individual experiences of social and structural stigma. These experiences inform their expectation of future stigma, which is anticipated, and influence self-perception, which is going to be internalized. An example here is people with substance use disorders may be denied services from healthcare workers who assume that they are pill shopping or have been told they are not trusted to be alone in a family home because they might steal something. An outcome of this is that people with use disorders may experience prejudice, discrimination, and strain on their personal relationships, which is extremely important. Next, we have anticipated. This is going to reflect personal expectations of stereotyping prejudice and or discrimination from others in the future. So this is going to be people with substance use disorders potentially expecting that healthcare providers will not take their medical needs seriously because of their substance use disorder, or other friends and families will think that they are going to steal from them. An outcome of this is they might have avoidant behaviors individuals with use disorders causing them to pull away from existing support networks or resisting seeking medical help in the first place. Finally, we have internalized stigma. This is going to reflect internalized negative messages a person has about people who use drugs and the conflicts they then feel when they apply those things to themselves. So an example of this is people with substance use disorders may have developed stigma about use while learning about it in school and then feel that shame about their personal use. This can lead to many different issues, but people with substance or use disorder may experience depression, shame, and self-loathing because of this, and also have the why try effect. The why try effect is going to be saying things or thinking things like, why try to get treatment? Someone like me will surely fail. Or why bother looking for a job? Who would want to hire someone like me? Just to draw closer attention to it, I also want to add a note here that both anticipated and internalized stigma are direct results of experienced self-stigma. All right, so getting a little deeper into the effects of stigma, we've sort of seen where it comes from, what it might look like, and the, the technical structures involved. But what are the practical applications of you know, how this impacts people in recovery and people in active use? Obviously, a primary concern here is the effects on people with use disorders themselves. Um, we see stigma impacting people with use disorders in, in many mostly negative ways. Um, as previously mentioned, it can lead to low self-esteem, feelings of shame, and increase the risk of co-occurring mental health concerns, which is a huge issue in our community. 
We also see that this may cause someone to conceal their drug use, use drugs alone, which we know is one of the highest risk behaviors for potentially fatal overdose. It can discourage people to accessing education or resources that might make substance use less dangerous, engaging with harm reduction or safer use strategies, and it can isolate people from the most common support networks, friends, family, and workplace. You can see how all of these would present issues with encouraging people to seek and receive appropriate treatment. The effects of stigma also extend to the family and friends themselves. So people close to someone with a substance use issues can also experience what is sometimes called stigma by association. So research shows they are often blamed as the cause of the problem or the reason a problem is not re resolving. Family members or friends may be accused of enabling use behaviors, having bad boundaries, living in denial, or covering up the problem. I'm sure those are all terms and phrases we've heard thrown around quite a bit. The fundamental problem here is this creates a huge amount of additional stress on these support networks and can cause people to pull away from individuals with use disorders. Stigma also has a direct impact on the relationship between a patient and a provider and the appropriateness and effectiveness of treatment as a result. Surveys have found that one in four providers, in this case, emergency family and internal medicine providers, believe that treating individuals with OUD would attract quote unquote undesirable patients. 45% of healthcare professionals still believe that MAT and MOUD is substituting one drug for another. As I'm sure most folks here are aware, MAT is the use of medications for treatment that is the SAMHSA best approved practice for treating OUD specifically or opioid use disorder. So having a large number of providers discourage this line of treatment or not believe in it is a huge barrier. And you can see that direct impact on the fact that 22% of people with use disorders identify stigma as a barrier to seeking treatment. It's also important to recognize the interactivity of stigma and other forms of prejudice. We do see that stigma can both compound and exacerbate racism and prejudice and vice versa. Um, so there's historic precedent, especially with substance use issues of racializing use disorders. So we saw this in the 80s and 90s with the crack versus cocaine. And we saw it again in the early phase of the opioid crisis with perceptions on prescription opioid use versus heroin use. And the big concern here is it really leads to diverging policy and clinical responses, namely that more often than not, communities of color are criminalized for their use, and there's additional medicalization of use among white communities. So we see then that both racism both differentiates and compounds these experiences, and non-white individuals, especially black and indigenous populations, grapple with additional stigma perpetuated by racial stereotypes. And there is a very clear impact that this has on the treatment options for these groups. So they've done research that shows that treatment options, even methadone and buprenorphine, are available and stigmatized along these racial lines. This is only made worse by differences in financial and healthcare resources. As you can see on this slide, buprenorphine is much more readily available and prescribed to white patients and clients, whereas methadone is much more commonly used in areas where you have higher communities of color. And this is despite opioid use disorder occurring at similar rates across racial groups and socioeconomic classes. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the huge concern here is that Substance use stigma at the structural and social level really reflect a core consensus that society as a whole devalues persons with SUDs and legitimizes collective action to penalize this population through institutionalized systems, policies, and practices. And it creates a reinforcing cycle where we see structural stigma and social stigma reinforcing one another, and both of those influencing the preponderance of self-stigma. All right, so that's a lot of dark content, um, but we do want to turn the table a little bit here and talk about ways that we have found that can be effective at dismantling and fighting stigma through the work we do. One of the most effective tools we can utilize on an individual level is being super aware of our word choice and the impact that words can have. A harm reduction advocate, Don Coyas, is quoted as saying, words are important. If you want to care for something, you call it a flower. If you want to kill something, you call it a weed. So language has a very real and direct impact on how we understand and interact with the world around us. So changing the words we use can actually reframe how we interpret our experiences and how we engage with others. 
So words can carry a lot of baggage. Some of this is easier to recognize than others. And language is a super powerful tool, especially in this space, and can help to reinforce stigma or help to break it down. So a key indicator of this is something I'm sure you've noticed already. In this presentation, we've used the word substance use disorder a lot. It's really important that that is a shift that we all sort of commit to making. The definition of substance use disorder is a disorder that affects a person's brain and behavior, leading to a person's inability to control their use of substances such as legal or illegal drugs, alcohol, or medications. And that's the technical definition according to the National Institute of Health. So substance use disorder is considered preferred terminology now by most medical authorities, and it marks a shift away from words like addiction, addict, and drug abuse. So why is this important? It frames the issue as a medical condition and concern. It encompasses concepts of both dependence into addiction, and it's a purposeful shift away from stigmatizing language. And there's a number of other words that we can make a similar choice surrounding. The following slides are a few of our network suggestions. These are standards we uphold with our community trainers when they're interacting in community and presenting our core education topics. And we think that executing these more consistently can really help pull away from stigmatizing language. So normally we would do a little interactive thing with the trainers here, but given the environment, we're just gonna kind of go through the words themselves, why we recommend avoiding them, and some alternatives that we find to be more adequate and appropriate in most environments. So words that we recommend people you know, try to avoid are words like addict, junkie, druggie, and drug abuser. And why is this the case? These terms can be demeaning. They define the subject in terms of their condition rather than their personhood. Say a person is something rather than has something. So instead, we've shifted to using words like person with a substance use disorder, person with a use disorder, or person in active use. In a similar token, we are move, moving away from words like ex-addict and former addict because it has the same sort of reductive approach and moved forward into terms like person in recovery. A category of words describing you know, substance use disorder itself, habit, drug habit, drug abuse, previously pretty commonly used terms. The concern here is that habit really minimizes the medical nature and severity of a potential condition and abuse you know, brings with it connotations of malice and hostility. And that can really influence how people engage with the subject. So transitioning into something that's a little more neutral, like substance use disorder or active use, can be really beneficial. Some other related terminologies that we've seen, and this one's a little bit more complicated. I have an English background, so I'm a little obsessed with word history. But this is one of those more nuanced ones where the baggage really comes from the history of the word itself and might not be immediately apparent to most audiences. But relapse has roots in religion and is really meant to indicate like a lapse in moral standing or a lapse in faith and is indicative of that kind of a moral failure or moral hazard concern. So some more neutral terminology we can shift to is a resumption of use, return to use, or recurrence of an SUD if you really want to lean into the medical nature of it. Other words to avoid, clean, staying clean, and clean and dirty screens. The concern there being that dirty, opposite of clean, and this carries a lot of negative moral and physical connotations. So alternatives for clean and staying clean, in recovery, substance free, in abstinence, and alternatives for clean or dirty screens, negative positive screens. Just, you know, even though there still might be the implication of negativity or positivity there, because of the context, it really kind of turns the tables on which is which. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we really just want to focus on prioritizing first person language throughout. This is a shift that's been made in many other fields, including the mental health fields, that's really meant to focus on the person rather than their diagnosis. So the condition is something somebody has, not something they are. As you can see from kind of this visual representation, when you use the term addict, it really constrains people within the terms of an addiction. It puts the addiction first and foremost and can kind of eclipse the personhood behind that versus a person with a use disorder places the person first and the condition second or as an auxiliary item and can help kind of divorce those two ideas and give a little more autonomy to the individual. To demonstrate kind of the impact that these subtle shifts can have, this is a Google search from, I believe, late last year that kind of shows the cultural baggage that a word can have. So Google sort of auto-generates suggested searches when you sort of start typing in terms. And if you lead with addicts are, these are the suggestions it has. These are based on volume, frequency, 
the types of questions that are typically asked about a word. And you can see kind of there the, the damaging connotations that the term addict can carry with it. Versus shifting to something, just focusing on the condition itself, you know, addiction is, you can see that the terminology and the ideas carried there are a lot more neutral and a lot more clinical. And that's the power that these shifts can sort of have in terms of reframing how the conversation is taking place. One thing that's important to note is that, you know, obviously there are different environments in which these words get used. And if someone self-identifies as an addict, an alcoholic, an ex-addict, an ex-alcoholic, we never want to try and define their experience, you know? So this is a very helpful chart that's been put forward. And it sort of clarifies that in mutual aid meetings, in recovery situations, especially in peer recovery situations, those might be terms that get used and it's not our place to discourage their use in those environments. Um, we recognize that it can be difficult to challenge the use of stigmatizing language in others, especially in friends, family, loved ones. But we always encourage people to kind of use calling in language versus calling out. That can be really helpful. Um, so using did you know terminology, avoiding framing things as a right wrong basis and more like here's something I heard, here's something that I've seen and also always being sure to separate the intent of the words from the impact of the words. As we mentioned earlier, like stigma is learned like anything else that we learn in our lives. And so it's entirely possible that somebody just has not been exposed to an alternative way of thinking about it, considering it, or talking about it. So opening the conversation up, making it a dialogue and a learning opportunity. Maybe you hear someone, you know, call it a habit, call it drug abuse, and you could just say, like, actually, it turns out they're saying substance use disorder now. That's just what I've heard. <laughs> you know, if somebody maybe makes a comment that you feel might be hurtful to somebody who's in recovery or somebody with substance use disorder, maybe just say, like, hey, as your friend, maybe we could just talk about what you meant by that. And always understanding that, you know, a lot of times that leads to, I know it wasn't your intent. I know you didn't mean it that way. But here's how it might be interpreted and here's why it can be hurtful. So again, implementing this on a personal, interpersonal level, super important, but it's also equally important for authorities and voices like writers, anchors, and news officials to be aware that their voices influence public opinion. So addressing the way that media can sort of reinforce stigma includes making this a, a concerted and structural shift on that level. So these professions should seek to avoid stigmatizing language and be cautious about reinforcing stereotypes. And we should also improve industry standards in the education and professional development opportunities for people in these groups. There's a really awesome tool out right now. It's called Reporting on Addiction. And it's sort of a compendium of these types of resources for people in those fields. It provides support to journalists, students, and media organizations. And the goal is to decrease stigma and improve the media's portrayal of addiction recovery. So that's uh, reportingonaddiction.org. We have a ton of tools there, a resource list of addiction science experts to be consulted on stories and things like that. So if you guys know anyone who works in media who'd be interested in that tool, I'd strongly recommend it. Continuing on with sort of fictional media, um, diversifying how we depict substance use issues in popular media has a huge impact on uh, broader social perceptions of use disorders and how we understand these narratives. Um, it's super encouraging that we've seen individuals with lived experience being more directly involved in these types of projects. Um, obviously nothing's perfect, but on the uh, right side of the screen here, you see some more recent projects that have had people with lived experience directly involved in the creative process. And it just creates a more nuanced and balanced depiction of these stories. Structural protections are gonna be essential to breaking down the structural stigma. Obviously that's gonna be one of the most challenging and long-term projects that we have ahead of us. It's really important to implement laws and policies that protect people with use disorders from structural stigma. And we've seen some of those go into effect, some are still pending, and some we're working towards every day. But things like housing and employment protections are huge. Things that bar landlords or potential employees from discrimination based on an individual's history of substance use. You know, shelter and employment are hugely important in stabilizing people's experience. And if that is taken away from them by not protecting, that's ultimately a disservice to the people we serve. Expanding treatment and coverage options, things like parity laws that encourage mental health coverage and substance use disorder coverage 
be covered at the same rate as physical health concerns. It's been hugely impactful and removing criminal penalties to prioritize rehabilitative strategies. It's super important to decrease punitive illegal approaches to addressing substance use. We've seen things like the Help Seal My Record program in Minnesota or you know, things like the Minnesota Rehabilitation and Reinvestment Act, which are really focused on addressing these concerns. Improving structural response and access to naloxone is part of the work we do, and it really helps save lives, but it also reframes overdose intervention as a more standard concern of crisis or first aid preparedness. So we've seen that be hugely impactful as well. So SRHN developed toolkits for schools and emergency responders, and we are working on those same toolkits for other groups that incentivize folks to establish naloxone policy, especially in public spaces. Ultimately, the best weapon, weapon against stigma is education on these issues. So really consistently educating students, the public, and beyond that substance use disorder is a real and long-term medical condition. It's not the result of bad choices, but an illness with many risk factors, both physiological and environmental. There's no cure for SUD, but there are treatments that can help manage symptoms and improve people's outcomes over time. And treatment, super importantly, is not one size fits all. So different things work for different people, and it's important to give everyone the opportunity to find what works best for them. As mentioned earlier, uh, we have a history of not necessarily handling substance use education very well at young ages, and many studies have shown that abstinence-only drug education is not necessarily always going to be the most effective prevention strategy for all students. So there's, again, as an awesome resource, the Drug Policy Alliance has the following recommendations and a full toolkit on student-focused education. Um, with the safest path for teens, obviously always prioritized avoid drugs, but recognizing that some youth will try drugs and they should be aware of both the risks and strategies for staying safer. So they believe that drug education should be scientifically accurate, honest, interactive, and compassionate. And again, they have a great resource um, for setting up those types of programs. Uh, broadly speaking, we believe that it's really important to introduce these types of conversations to any and all fields that might naturally interact with people with use disorders with any degree of frequency. So a broader range of professions need to prioritize this type of training, including primary care providers, nurses, social workers, first responders. You know, these roles need to increasingly prioritize appropriate response to substance use concerns. So as kind of a encapsulation of all these initiatives, how can we move forward? So we want to address self-stigma, um, by being in community, normally normalizing conversations about lived experience and prioritizing connection. We want to address social stigma by pushing back on stigmatizing language, both for ourselves and others, discouraging jokes or comments that get made at the expense of people with use disorder. And we want to address structural stigma by advocating for some of the policy changes that we looked at and learning about local legislative initiatives that might have a direct impact on the communities we serve. So keeping these priorities in mind, we really seek to decrease stigma by implementing small or big changes in all aspects of our lives. I think ultimately having open and honest discussions with people in these environments is gonna be one of the best paths forward.